after this event is that I am now on a t-shirt with Ron Burgundy. <laughs> so, great honor to me. Ron, come on, where are you? Here we is, he's right here! Mark John, that nobody at the Oscars is worried about following Price Waterhouse. Uh, <laughs> uh, but following you is pretty intimidating. Um, people don't know that Mark has a deep interest in background in theater, so I his, his book I love. Thank you. And thanks, Ron. So uh, you may have heard this from me before because I know and love so many of you, but I believe that there is a virtuous part inside all of us that wants to contribute things of value and beauty to the world. I do feel that there are some adults where it's a little hard to find that virtuous part of them because it's buried pretty deep. It's there, but it's deep. That is not true of kids. For kids, it's right there, right underneath. And even if they are the challenged kids, even if they are the kids who are making bad choices right now, right underneath that, they are looking for a place where they can contribute good work. They really want to. They want to contribute things of value and beauty and importance to the world that will make them respected and ignored. What if school were the place where they could make that contribution? What if school were the place where kids could contribute things of value and beauty? That's why I'm proud to be here today, because all of you, teachers and school leaders, the network leaders, the people working in policy and philanthropy and research that are here. You are all in schools or supporting schools that give kids that chance to do beautiful work. <coughs> that is not something I had personally growing up. I did not go to bad schools and I was not a disaffected student. <coughs> I appreciated school. School was much of the time a place that was relatively safe physically and emotionally. My home was not. I had some teachers who I knew cared about me, cared about me as a person. But I never had that opportunity. School was not that place like your schools and the schools you're supporting where kids have that chance to do something beyond their teacher and make a contribution that they're proud of. That's something that I wish I could say. For 13 years I was in public school and I have not a single thing that I would bring with me today to say that I'm proud to share with you from that time. And in contrast, the schools that you work with every day give kids that opportunity to make a contribution of goodness and greatness. It's a different paradigm. And beyond the schools that you work with, I would say that every school in America has teachers that wish they could help kids do beautiful and great things. And our mission is not just to help ourselves, but to create a conceptual framework and an inspiration and structures that teachers all over America can say, that's what I want to do too. I want to be inspired by these folks to do beautiful work with my students too. It's not just us. It's, it's everywhere. You know that teachers are wishing. That's why they got into teaching in the first place. Now, I've been using the word beautiful work. And I, I want to first make sure you understand that I'm not just talking about art work. Although I am talking about poems, and essays, and paintings, and performances, and sculptures. But I'm also talking about beautiful math, and beautiful engineering, and carpentry. I'm also talking about beautiful acts of courage and kindness that are that are publicly understood and celebrated within a school community. So in my school, every kid was on their own. When I went to high school, my mission was to get myself into college. In your schools, the student's mission is to get themselves and all of their colleagues there. It's their mission is deeper and bigger. It's how do I help all of my peers succeed? So those acts of kindness and courage that permeate your school communities are also acts of beauty and goodness. And there's one more step, and that's the purpose of this morning's keynote. And it's not going to be me sharing that step with you. 
It's going to be for inspirational students. But there's those acts of beauty and goodness that are actually acts of citizenship to change your world to be a better world. Maybe the small world around you or maybe the broader world. And we have four students today who are going to share an act of citizenship that is as nice an example of beautiful work as I've ever seen. And it's really going to be my honor just to introduce them to you. I do want to point out that I have not yet used the word deeper learning. <laughs> I've been talking about beautiful work. So what's the connection between beautiful and good work and deeper learning? I'm not going to answer that. Because this is a deeper learning conference. <laughs> we don't give you easy answers. I am going to share a few things with you that I hope will provoke questions for you about the confluence of beautiful, important work and deeper learning. I'm going to show you a short video, and then I'm going to introduce four students who will give you what I feel is as great an example of beautiful work and of deeper learning as I can imagine. And then that's something for you to make sense of in your, with your colleagues and in your schools, not something for me to tell you. This is a short video I'm going to share with you. It's five minutes, um, but I need to frame it for you. So let me frame it. A few years ago, the Common Core Standards hit America. So 46 states and Washington, D.C. have adopted those standards. And a lot of people are excited about them and look at them as an opportunity for all of us to step up to a new challenge. And a lot of people hate them, and they're fighting them. And the people that are fighting them are on all sides of the political and pedagogical spectrum. Let me give you my personal sense of this moment. I've been in education almost 40 years. This is the first time in my lifetime that almost every school in America is reconsidering, are they teaching the right stuff, and are they teaching it in the right way? Somebody's going to answer those questions for them. I want the people answering those questions to be you, the people in this room. I don't want Pearson and Scholastic answering that question for them. And there are many good people, I'm sure, at Pearson and Scholastic, and I'm sorry to use them as a foil. But there's a difference in the heartfelt work you are doing with kids every day than from for-profit big organizations trying to figure out how to capture this moment to make money from it. We can define what these Common Core standards mean. I, when people read those standards, I want them to think, oh, those standards talk about the kind of work that big picture learning and high tech high and new tech. <coughs> I want them to think, the kids at internationals, that's what, that's what these are. The kids that are in that one classroom in our local school who are doing incredible, beautiful work, that's what those standards would be. If we don't define those standards, someone else will for us. And we could be cynical and say, How, who are we to stand up to Pearson and Scholastic? Except, let me just give you one ray of hope. We, in our organization, Expeditionary Learning, started creating curriculum that's deeper learning curriculum, matched to the Common Core. And New York State <coughs> chose our curriculum over Pearson and over Scholastic it's being used in every single school district in New York State. Over a thousand schools are using it right now. A million kids. It's not impossible for us to define a deeper learning version of the Common Core to, to find its potential. So, it's a long framing for this video. For the last 20 years, I've... Sorry, 30 years. <laughs> I've been obsessed with collecting beautiful, important students. And many of you have been on that journey with me. Long before High Tech High existed, I was working with Larry Rosenstock in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as he was having his students build incredible things. In fact, everybody in the school was jealous because Larry's office was like a palace because he and the students built it together. <laughs> and his students were sort of in charge of things. And these were the vocational kids. How come they were doing the most brilliant work in the school? And then Larry came out here, brought Rob with him, founded this incredible thing, brought Ben Daly in. This has been going on for me my whole life, is this celebration of uniting heart and hand and mind into having kids really do great things. Because I think we underestimate, as a nation, 
the capacity of kids to do great things. And I don't mean like you do in your schools, you understand this. I don't mean getting kids ready for 13 years and then four more years of college and then graduate school so eventually they can enter the world and do great things. I mean you're doing great things when they're second graders. I mean doing great things when they're eighth graders. I mean being great citizens right now. Because you learn to be great by being great now. You learn to be a citizen by doing it right now. You learn to build great things by building things. And in that passion, I've had one colleague, Steve Seidel, who's been collecting student work with me for 30 years. That some of that work was on the screen right before you got here. It's from all over. It's an open source archive that people are contributing to. And Steve and I teach a course at Harvard Graduate School called Models of Excellence using student work to illuminate what the Common Core standards could be. So it's not being limited by the Common Core, but saying, starting with the Common Core, what could it really look like? So the video I'm going to show you now is from one of my students in that class. When our students came into class, this is what we said. You're not writing any papers for us. This is not a class for you to write something for us to grade. You're going to create something of importance for the world, and we're going to put it online as a free access. Free. Just like the curriculum that Yale has created is free curriculum, open to the world. You're, you in this class are going to create something of quality that will illuminate how beautiful student work can connect to common core standards. So when teachers are searching for standards, they'll think, oh, that's what it looks like. Incredibly beautiful, important work. That's what we should be aspiring toward not compliance. So I can only show you one of those videos. This video uh, was done by a student named Salma Alam. She uh, was Pakistani and she was with us for one year. She's back in Pakistan right now. She had done no filmmaking in her life, so she has always asked me to apologize that this is an amateur film. Um, but what's here is the heart. The filmmaking not, may not be perfect, but the vision is really clear. And this is my first provocation to you, to make that connection between beautiful work and inquiry. <laughs> Despite a lifetime of the very best education, students in our classrooms are failing to learn science. Many of these students will graduate from college with the same scientific misconceptions that they had on entering grade school. To test how a lifetime of education affects our understanding of science, we ask these recent graduates some simple questions in astronomy. Okay, I think the seasons happen because as the Earth travels around the sun, it gets nearer to the sun, um, which produces warmer weather and gets farther away, which produces colder weather, and, that's, and hence the season. And it gets hotter when we get closer to the sun, and it gets colder when we get further away from the sun. These graduates, like many of us, think of the Earth's orbit as a highly exaggerated ellipse. Even though the Earth's orbit is very nearly circular, with distance producing virtually no effect on the seasons, we carry with us the strong, incorrect belief that changing distance is responsible for the seasons. Regardless of their science education, 21 of the 23 randomly selected students, faculty, and alumni of Harvard University <laughs> revealed misconceptions when asked to explain either the seasons or the phases of the moon. I can describe the relationship between scientific ideas and concepts using language that pertains to time, sequence, and cause and effect. The half tilted towards the sun gets more direct sunlight. The other half is tilted away and not getting direct sunlight, so it's winter on that part. The Earth orbits around the sun and the tilt doesn't change. So when the Earth orbits to the other side of the sun, the southern hemisphere is now tilted towards the sun and having summer and the northern hemisphere is tilted away so it's having winter. Spring is a transition from winter to summer. So that part of the earth starts to get a little more direct summer. Fall is a transition from summer to winter. The most important thing that causes the season is the tilt of the earth. 
So we worked with students just on looking, doing a lot of looking at, at the sky, looking at what's going on in the world, and using that to inspire questions. And so the students then created their own questions, but instead of um, deciding to do a video project, we thought that we could create um, a book by students, for students, that were frequently asked questions about space. I can write explanatory text to examine the topic and convey ideas and information clearly. Thinking about early third graders, and a uh, target that I have in writing is I can answer a question clearly. So what does it mean to be able to clearly answer a question? There's a lot of parts to that. You, of course, need to be able to make a statement that um, kind of supports your main idea. You need to think about what it is that your reader needs to know to clearly understand the answer to your question. That might include details that support your main idea. That might include clarification of specific vocabulary terms and things that they need. So the act of writing about it really forced them to think more clearly about it and to go deeper into the content. I can include illustrations when useful to aiding comprehension. They also had to spend a lot of time on um, making that sketch that really explained the answer to their question too. So there were lots of drafts of that that helped them to kind of hone in more and more on their own understanding of the question. <laughs> Cause and effect. Kids had uh, models, uh, styrofoam balls on toothpicks and a flashlight, and they had to demonstrate how how it's how it could be different, you know, day right now and, and nighttime somewhere else. But in the second part of the exhibition night, they were out in the lobby of the planetarium and had models, had diagrams, um, had the actual piece of writing that they wrote, the page that went into the book and needed to be able to answer that question to people who came up to their tables. So all of those things really worked together to drive students' understanding of the answer to the question at the same time that it was driving their ability to write clearly. Like a year that will go for like a really long time without getting the sunlight, and then there's also parts um, like the theater that are always going to have direct so those students were writing with a purpose, and one of the things that distinguishes what we do here is that students feel like the purpose is not to do an assignment for their teacher. The purpose is to contribute something beyond their classroom that matters. And their motivation to become deeper learners and do beautiful work is a motivation that's noble and deep. It's that, it's that motivation for contribution. Um, I'm going to introduce you now uh, an example of that that is really stirring for me. And I need to frame it by saying there is a feeling today in education that we need to narrow education to only basic skills in math and reading. And that we particularly need to narrow education to basic skills in math and reading for students of color, for students of low income, for students rurally or in urban settings that are behind in those areas. It's not being framed as, what if we embedded those basic skills in projects that matter? What if we embedded those basic skills in a purpose for learning that was deeper and more noble and allowed for contribution? It's, let's work on the basic skills for 13 years, and then maybe kids will have that opportunity. There's a school here that we're featuring, and that's Polaris Charter Academy in Chicago that took a different approach. They said, OK, our kids may fit that profile. They may be urban kids of color who are coming in with low skills. But we're going to give them the opportunity to do beautiful work and contribute right away. And we'll work on their basic skills at the same time as their hearts are motivated to do that work. So this school opened seven years ago. And it opened K-2. to That entering class of second graders came. And those kids are now eighth graders. We have four of them here today. Their first graduating class. 
When those second graders entered this school, only 8% of them could read at grade level. These are exactly the kinds of kids in America where we would say, there's no hope of giving them ambitious, powerful, beautiful opportunities. It, not until they're totally caught up in all those things. This is exactly the profile where reductionist education is brought in. And yet, that's not the approach the school used. <clears throat> Two of the founders of that school, Michelle Navarre and Royal Vivid, are here. <clears throat> Along with the teachers of these kids, and I, I just want to shout out Carrie Moy and Francesca Peck, and Georgette Verdon, who is the coach of these kids in drama. Just, these are people you'll have to talk to after, along with talking to these kids. First of all, no surprise, this is now one of the highest performing schools in Chicago. Also no surprise, these kids outscore district and state averages in literacy. And at the same time, these kids are working to change the world. The notion of can you become more standards and try to change the world at the same time is a question that isn't even a question once you listen to them. They took on something that has what I believe many kinds of courage. I've been really interested in writing and thinking about courage lately. And I've framed it a lot with a school, Renaissance, Springfield Renaissance School, that some of you may know Steve Mahoney, who's sitting right up here, um, who's a, a beloved character in our world. <laughs> and uh, founded the Springfield Renaissance School, and I've been writing and filming there about this notion of courage. I have been writing about a different notion of courage. I got this notion from my friend Scott Hartle, who's now president of Expeditionary Learning, but when he started, he was like, Stephen Levy and he and I were the only employees, basically. You know, this was 20 years ago. We didn't know what we were doing. And Scott had just climbed the mountain right next to Everest. He was one of only two people on his team that summited. The team next to him had someone who died, not from his country. This was what we usually think of as courage, like crazy physical courage. And Scott was totally humble about his accomplishment. Because he said, that's not the way I think about courage. Courage isn't one thing. You have different kinds of courage for different. I have mountain climbing courage. I don't necessarily have public speaking courage, or writing courage, or relationship courage. And so I thought, oh yeah, well, there's all these different kinds of courage. And we all have courage in certain domains and not in others. And it became a very useful thing for me. Because with my own family then, we started talking about what I call differentiated courage. And so my own kids, and now my grandkids would talk about, I'm working on my ocean courage. I'm working on my sleepover courage. I'm working on my airplane courage. I don't know if you guys had to work on that. <laughs> These guys flew for the first time this year. They would say, I'm working on my friendship courage. And no longer did they tease each other for not being brave, because when they felt like we all need to work on our courage for different things. And it's been useful for me in my life. And when I started spending time at Springfield Renaissance School, I started <coughs> seeing courage in every part of the school. Personal courage in kids coming from very difficult home situations and stepping up to be at school on time and try. Personal courage in kids reaching out emotionally and socially to kids that were from different neighborhoods, different races, different backgrounds, and being honest with them in crew sessions. Academic courage in so many ways. Academic courage in kids being able to make mistakes in front of their peers, to ask questions in class, to speak up. The courage just to show you care about your learning. And in many urban environments, it's, it's just not cool to show you care. And even little micro courages. Kids would say, I'm working on my vocabulary courage. I'm working on my courage to try out new words. I'm working on my courage to, to write in a whole different way, to develop my academic voice. I think what you'll hear from these four students is courage in so many different domains. From the actual courage of taking on a scary enterprise in a very tough neighborhood, to the courage for them to step up as scholars in so many ways. So when you're listening to these students today, be thinking of, there's another kind of courage I see in these kids. I, I love that Mark st started with these teacher movies and high school movies. 
because I grew up watching the Teacher Hero movies. <laughs> and in the Teacher Hero movie, it's all about the one teacher who is really great. And those teachers are real. They're based on real people. And they really are heroes, but they're not so useful for us. What's more useful for us is this notion of student heroes. And these four students are not only heroes, but they will tell you right away, they are spokes for the heroes of their founding class at this school, all about to graduate and go on to high school. I don't want to say a thing about their project because they can describe it so much more beautifully than I. But my wife is not a, a, a teacher, an educator at all. She's a nurse. There are very few things I show to my wife that she's willing to really say, OK, you get to show me just a few things in here that are about education. The video of D'Angelo, Desiree, Amira, and Cameron. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. It made my wife understand why we do what we do. Sorry to get emotional. I couldn't be more honored than to introduce to you D'Angelo, Desiree, Amir, and Cameron from Columbus Charter Academy. United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. At this time, we'd like to ask you to turn and talk with the neighbor about what this preamble means in your life today. <laughs> Chicago, Illinois, and we feel very fortunate to be here at the Deeper Learning Conference, presenting to a group of educators so committed to improving the lives and opportunities of young people just like us. <laughs> We're not sure what connection you made between the preamble to the Constitution and your own life, but last year when we started Justice for All, that's a title by your long expedition. When we started it, we weren't sure what connections to make. This is what we figured out. Wait, wait, let's back it up a minute and explain to everyone how the expedition began. You see, our teachers, Ms. Moy, Ms. Peck, and Mr. Vivid, are pretty smart. They knew it was gonna take a lot more than just reading a crusty old document written way before any of us were born to convince us that what's in the Constitution still matters today. And so it began with the case study of Hurricane Katrina. To build up our background knowledge, we watched the 2006 documentary, When the Levee Spoke, a requiem in four acts directed by Spike Lee. The documentary was made up of photos, interviews, and news reports, revealing the intense devastation endured by the residents of New Orleans. If you haven't seen this documentary, you should. If you have, they understand how this film drove our need to find out more. Armed with a bit of background and tons of questions, we started researching the science behind hurricanes, how levees are engineered, and why they didn't hold up. We also examined the impact of this natural disaster on a personal level, 
Analyzing data around lost homes, displaced residents, inadequate supplies, and death tolls. We realize that this is much more than just a natural disaster. It was also a man-made catastrophe. It begs the question, the guiding question that is, whose responsibility is it to ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity? Suddenly, the Constitution mattered. So we did a close reading of the Constitution and tried to figure out what it all means and how it related to the work we were studying. So again, we asked our guiding question, whose responsibility is it to ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity? We expected the answer to be no. Because either you're right or you're wrong. Right? Wrong. <laughs> um, we learned that the U.S. Constitution is big and vague and hard to interpret. That the founding fathers of our country wrote it that way on purpose, for our protection, to ensure that no one branch has too much power. Turns out that although what the people in the audience have to face after Hurricane Katrina was awful, the government hadn't done anything wrong. Constitutionally wrong, that is. At Polaris, we are taught to have integrity, compassion, to be critical thinkers, to explore new ways of solving problems, and to serve as active citizens. So it was hard for us, it was hard for us to accept that there was nothing we could do to change the experiences of those who survived Katrina and nowhere to place the blame. So we're back to the question of whose responsibility is it? And where do we fit in as 13 year olds who aren't even allowed to vote? What are our rights? Where's our power to impact change? Turns out it's in the Bill of Rights. These are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. To really understand these amendments, our teachers had to take us beyond Katrina. To help us understand how amendments are interpreted, we studied landmark Supreme Court cases. Not only landmark cases, but cases involving students. We learned that the Supreme Court protects our rights as well. Cases like Frederick v. Morse and Tinker v. Des Moines, where the courts protected the First Amendment when they determined that students do not shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. In December, we were introduced to the Second Amendment through the sub-question. Who is responsible for gun control? The people or the government? This amendment protects people's right to bear arms. We started by studying the gun debate in Chicago and researched how policymakers shaped city gun laws and debated their constitutionality. Within a week of studying the Second Amendment, the shootings at Sandy Hook Elementary School happened. Like the rest of our country, we were shocked, scared, and saddened by the census act of extreme violence. This tragedy was a turning point in our expedition. It created a sense of fear and urgency. Schools were supposed to be a safe place, but suddenly we felt vulnerable. We started having conversations about how gun violence has affected our own lives. Teachers set aside time during crew for us to share our stories. When we survey our crew members, what we found might shock you. It sure surprised us. 84% of our crew members have been around a gun. I have an uncle who's in a gang and never goes anywhere without his gun. 96% of our 8th grade crewmates know someone who has been shot or killed. My cousin was shot at point blank range on his way back from getting a cup of coffee. 100% of us have, at some time or another, felt unsafe in our own neighborhood. Personally, I'm scared to play outside because when I do, I have to watch disturbing things like people getting arrested. I even had someone break into the basement of my house to escape the police. What I think people need to understand is that gun violence isn't new for us.
We've lived with it our whole lives. We just didn't really talk about it because up until last year, we accepted it as just the way things were. But something about what happened at Sandy Hook Elementary School made it all real in a different way. It brought up lots of fears about our own lives and we wanted someone to do something. So again, we asked our guiding question. Whose responsibility is it to ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity? We decided that if we want justice and domestic tranquility in our home and in our neighborhood, if we want general welfare to be safe for us to walk to school and play outside, if we want what children all over want, the opportunity to grow up, get smart, and do good. We had to devise a plan. And the Peacekeeper Project was born. This is our school. in our neighborhood. These people lost their lives just blocks away from our school. One of those dots can be one of my best friends. One of those dots can be my cousin. One of those dots could be my father. One of those dots could be my little sister. One of those dots could be me. Walter Burnett Jr. We went to City Hall to present our vision to have a day of peace on June 10, 2015. His enthusiastic response got us so excited. We immediately started networking through our Alderman's connections. Alderman Burnett suggested that we team up with the West Humble Park Development Council. 
This would be the beginning of a very strong partnership. Our project managers got on the phone and began booking interviews and expert visits. Our alderman also gave us contact information for a government official who had organized citywide gun tournaments in the past. We've tried a bunch of times to schedule meetings with them, but we couldn't get them to talk to us. Can you believe that? <laughs> we quickly learned how hard it is to get some policymakers to take time from their busy schedules to talk with us. After several more dead ends, it was discouraging, but we had to face the fact that our day of peace might not include a gun turning. But instead of quitting, we revised our call to action, focusing on a citywide day of peace and a neighborhood sweeping green. We became aware that to affect change, we couldn't wait for policymakers. We the people needed to come together and take direct action. Our experts were the key to understanding how. These people are community activists. They are direct action in action. So we did research and generated hard hitting questions for them so they can help us better understand how we can become community activists. Captain Roger Ray of the 11th District Chicago Police Department was the first expert to get real with us. He came to our school, shared neighborhood statistics, talked about what the police are doing and the need for community action. Captain May said that he was glad we weren't focused on gun turn-ins or calling for more police action in the area. Captain May feels that gun turn-ins and a bigger police force are temporary solutions. He said that if we really wanted to change things in our neighborhood, we needed to start by building relationships and strengthening the culture of our community. This was starting to sound familiar. At Polaris, we are an EL school. So building culture and exploring what it really means to be a community is the center of everything we do. Now we just needed to bring what we knew about building crew out of our school and into our neighborhood. <laughs> this is where things really began to take off. Teams of students were working on different aspects of our expedition at the same time. Some of us were attending meetings to spread the word to the broader community. Several times, we were asked by different organizations, like the Westville Park Development Council, to speak in community meetings about the work that we were doing. What was amazing was that adults were actually starting to listen to us. Other teams were researching and developing PSA interview questions for our 16 experts. We interviewed people like Amina Matthews, who's dedicated her life to being a violence interrupter. Reverend Dr. Jeanette Wilson, the senior advisor to Jesse Jackson Jr. and the first female national president for the Rainbow Push Coalition. And John Groney, the, the director of housing services for our neighborhood of West Humboldt Park. These are incredible people working tirelessly to stop the violence and make Chicago a safer city. They provided us with firsthand information about the complex issues around gun violence. Still, Others of us were working on writing and editing scripts, selecting sound bites from our interviews, and directing the filming of our four PSAs. At the same time, we worked with a local photographer to learn how to take portraits of our experts for our book. Soon word spread about our project. Frank Holler from WGN News came to our school and did a cover story on the work we were doing. Alicia Sams, the co-director of the documentary, By the People, the Election of Barack Obama, heard about us and came to talk about filmmaking and documentary work. We were invited to present to a panel of experts at the Constitutional Rights Foundation Chicago. And the Action-Based the Action -based Communities Project at Loyola University Law School, where we were presented with an award for the most inspiring call to action. Alderman Burnett was also working to spread the word for us. He aired all four of our PSAs on his cable television show. He also brought them to a city council meeting and played one PSA for the entire city council, including Mayor Rahm Emanuel. This is what they saw.
my sons got into drugs. Oh. And it's been so painful. Not as bad as my son's death, but because of his death, his brother's death, and now he's doing better. But um, it affects people, you know, family members in different ways. As you may know, this neighborhood at one time, uh, most folks moved over here, used to work in a lot of the industries here in the neighborhood. A lot of those industries closed down, and so a lot of people had to uh, figure out different things to do, and, and a lot of folks lost their jobs. And, and we've been dealing with some of the drug trafficking that's been going on in this neighborhood for many years. Matter of fact, uh, some as long as three or four generations, uh, we've been dealing with it, unfortunately. Um, so as an inspired, it was like always in my heart, but I didn't start really actively working in it until my cousin was killed in um, 2011. I think that gun violence has really gotten worse over time, and I think that's because there's not enough people in the community that care about the youth and are taking the time out of their so-called busy schedules to stop and talk to the youth. Like, um, you know, we were blessed to get the YMCA built uh, here in the community and there were some dollars to make that happen. We need to get more after school programs going on for the young people. Uh, we're trying to work with Oral High School right now. Uh, Oral High School, a lot of folks don't know that that park, that where the gym is and the swimming pool, is a park district park. Young people to get involved because it's the younger people, that generation that's going to be involved with this issue. Unfortunately, but it's it's on them and coming upon people like yourself and, and others uh, to stop this this ap epidemic that's been going around throughout the country and uh, and stop using guns as a means to resolve disputes. You know, we need resources. We can't just let things go. We need to be there. We need to speak up. Gun violence is a huge problem for all of Chicago. Too many children families are living in fear. Fear that while playing outside, they will be the next victim. We can stop the gun violence by creating more jobs and activities that youth will feel is interesting or they will participate. We also need to give our youth mentors to look up to and follow. We need to bring more opportunities to the community. We can make our community stronger by looking for job training, attending community meetings, and getting involved. Contact your audience to get information on programs that are available. Join us in helping people get off the street by giving them something better to do with their lives. Stand up to violence by coming out to our Peace Rally, June 9th, in Cows Park, located in West Humble Park. We have planned a day of peace on June 10th, and we would like to see our communities bonding together, pledging 24 hours of non-gun violence. We were really busy spreading the word about our day of peace using our PSAs. We also spent time passing out flyers to promote our community sweeping greet. For those of you who don't know what a sweeping greet is, it's where you get all of the neighbors out of their houses at the same time, on the same day, to clean up their yards and get to know one another. <laughs> In our neighborhood, this was, this was a big deal, since trash is everywhere and people don't talk to each other. If this wasn't enough, we were also working on our second final product, published our book, Peacekeepers of Chicago. <laughs> Although it didn't get as much press as our Day of Peace or our PSAs, to me, Peacekeepers of Chicago is one of the most important things we did last year. It was important because instead of highlighting gun violence, which everyone knows is a problem, we wrote a book honoring the people who are trying to be the solution. They are the we and we the people. If you haven't done it, let me tell you, writing a book is not easy. <laughs> That's when you learn that writing is a process. Sometimes a painful. Especially when it's a collaborative process. Uh -huh. <laughs> For the Peacekeeper book, groups of three students co-author a biographical sketch. Peacekeepers of Chicago was a culmination of everything we had learned about writing that year. The Common Core State Standards puts a special focus on argumentative writing. 
the biographical sketches were written as argumentative writing pieces that had to defend the claim that each person deserved the title of peacekeeper. In order to write interesting and accurate sketches of our experts, we had to include everything we had learned about informative and narrative writing as well. In order to do our peacekeepers justice, we began by studying mentor texts, like small acts of courage from King Middle School to make sure we really understood exactly what a biographical sketch was. Then we have to closely analyze our primary source documents, which were the interviews we recorded at Westinghouse High School. We watched those videos about a hundred times looking for concrete detail, examples, and quotations. We had to use evidence to defend our claim that each person was truly a peacekeeper. The hardest part was figuring out what was most important in all of that information and deciding what was relevant for our bio sketch. Sometimes we found that the information we gathered from their interviews wasn't enough, so we had to get information from multiple sources, like articles, journals, op-ed pieces, or the internet. Then we had to make sure that we were using the right transitions to make our writing cohesive. I never knew it could be so hard to make three different voices fit together to make one piece. How many drafts we went through as we did our peer critique sessions in order to help us revise our work. We spent a lot of time revising to make our bio sketches clear, convincing, and correct. The finished product is a book that we are really proud of and something that we could give to our peacekeepers for the work they do for our community. We are also proud of the fact that it was good enough to be accepted into the Mary Daly branch of the Chicago Public Library. So there we were. We created and filmed four PSAs, wrote a book, planned the community sweep and greet, and worked really hard to promote June 10th, 2013 as a citywide day of peace. We were all set to change the world. 50 seventh graders from Polaris Charter Academy were going to bring peace to the entire city of Chicago. <laughs> so, do you want to know what happened? Do you want to know what did? In the Hollywood movie version of our story, the answer would be a definite yes. As a result of all our work, we would now live in a super clean neighborhood nestled in a violence-free city. Wrong! <laughs> this is reality. On June 9th, we held our first sweeping day. It was fun, but not many neighbors pitched in. We held a big rally in our neighborhood park with music and food. We were disappointed that not many people showed up, but instead of giving up an idea, we decided to keep hosting them. Each time we do another sweeping day, more people join in. I guess persistence really does pay off. <laughs> June 10th was our scheduled citywide day of peace. We asked our entire city to put down their guns. Our call to action was to have a day with no violence, no shootings, no killings. The reality is that we fell short of that goal. June 10th was not a day of peace for the entire city, but it was for our community. This is the email that we got from Captain Bay that outlines what happened on June 10th, 2013. Subject, peace on the west side. <coughs> I have remarkable news to share regarding June 10th, a day of peace. There are no shootings or murders anywhere in your community. The 11th district had no serious incidents of violence at all. There were no shootings or murders in West Humble Park, Humble Park, East Garfield Park, West Garfield Park, North Lawndale, Lawndale, Austin, or Hermosa. Violence was present in other parts of the city. One elderly woman was stabbed to death in the 4th District on the far southeast side of the city. A shooting in the 7th District, Inglewood, resulted in five people being shot, and one of them died from his injuries. A shooting in the 3rd District resulted in one man being shot. A shooting in the 9th district resulted in one man being shot. A shooting in the 20th district resulted in one man and one woman being shot. I believe that the results show that there is more work to be done. There are more people that need to be reached by people such as the ones that you met this year. The members of Ceasefire, the community organizers, and elected officials 
all need to continue their efforts to reduce violence in Chicago. Of course, all Chicago police officers continue to work to reduce crime, disorder, and the fear of crime in the city. Your efforts have helped to spread that message as well. Your Peacekeepers Project is so much more than other typical school projects. <laughs> a science fair project may lead to learning something valuable and possibly results in a trophy being awarded. The results of Peacekeepers is what I consider an ongoing conversation. People looking for solutions. People working toward those solutions. Everyone working together to make this year better than the last. This Peacekeeper Project taught us about so much more than just the Constitution. What we learned last year was this. When you are a city who has to pull yourself by, self up by your bootstraps to rebuild after a catastrophe. Or a school that has to figure out how to put all the pieces back together after a tragedy. Or seventh graders in a community on the west side of Chicago trying to make their neighborhood safe. What we learned is that this kind of work takes grit, perseverance, and persistence. That if things are going to be better, each of us, all citizens of the United States, need to be the people. At Polaris, we are working on being the living embodiment of the Constitution. What we mean is that we could have quit when policymakers wouldn't return our phone calls about a gun turn in. We could have quit when our Indiegogo campaign for our book fell short. We could have quit when not many people showed up for our first sweep of week. But the fact is, we did it. Sometimes we fall short, but we don't strive for perfection. We strive for progression. I'm not exactly sure how to define deeper learning, but I do know that through our work and every step of the process, we learn deeply. You see, what connects all of us in this room is not the knowledge of the definition of deeper learning, but the belief that deeper learning is a way of living. Deeper learning helps us truly understand ourselves and our world. Deeper learning gives us purpose and inspiration. And deeper learning calls us to be creative and courageous in the face of challenges that matter. When we started this Peacekeeper Project, we thought we were going to change our city. But what we really did was change ourselves. We know how incredibly fortunate we are to be in the hands of educators who push us to learn deeply. And we know that you're here because you push your students in those same ways. On behalf of students everywhere, thank you for believing in us. It is the work that you do that makes it possible for us to do projects with far-reaching impact, like the Peacekeepers. And it is the work that we do together that's going to make it possible for us to walk through the doors of high school and college and beyond, confident that we are prepared to, to succeed in this ever-changing world. Thank you.